Then let's get started with lecture 11, uh, the MCU net, any uh, new network design for microcontroller. This is my favorite class where we finally have covered all the techniques uh, we have uh, uh, talked about so far about inference, right? So we can use these techniques and design this tiny little neural nets that is deployable on microcontrollers, okay? All right, so here is the agenda for today. We'll start by talking about what is tiny ML, right? And understand the challenges. What are the challenges? And how do we solve the challenges by uh, tiny neural net design, okay? Covering several applications in vision, in audio, and also time series, and also anomaly detection, okay? Let's start the journey together. What is tiny ML? So this is the other direction, the big ML, right? But this is just so big. For example, the uh, OPT model we are recently working on has 170 billion parameters. Okay? We cannot fit it even in a single GPU for inference. We need eight GPUs to just run inference for such a uh, large model, right? So we need a tiny ML and green AI. Um, so the uh, tiny ML have several advantages, right? So if we have to upload the model to the cloud, what is the drawback? Privacy, right? Your data is uploaded to the cloud, right? So um, people might be uh, malicious, uh, stealing your data, right? So instead, we want to make sure how the model is uh, local, right? Both for inference and also for training, okay? Uh, for example, iPhone um, these days will uh, understand your photos, you can search, like going to the beach, having a part of something in your album to understand uh, your, your photos. Can we go even smaller, right? So that's tiny now, tiny AI, right? So for these IoT devices, for these microcontrollers, we want to be AI to be everywhere, right? These IoT devices are highly accessible, super cheap, like one to $2, and almost everywhere in our lives. Okay? We can democratize AI to a much broader audience, to um, um, a broader outreach right? by enabling AI on these small devices. And actually, those devices are actually quite ubiquitous, billions of tens of billions of units every year, and it's growing pretty fast. And they are uh, super cheap, uh, super low cost. Um, and also they are of low power. Right? They can uh, be powered by, by, a, by a battery very easily. It can last a long time um, in the wearable devices, in factories, etc. Okay. And also um, we can have such tiny ML in smart home, right? You can say, okay, Google, oh, hey Alexa, open the curtain, turn on the light, right? Play some music. Those are highly speech recognition um, applications. And also smart manufacturing, uh, we have this kind of anomaly detection uh, for uh, two, uh, one, di uh, one dimensional data, time series data, okay? why are they using smart manufacturing? And also those region based anomaly de detection, right? Rather than having uh, some engineers to, to eyeball check some of the anomalies, right? It'd be great to have a camera sitting over there just improving your productivity. And also, Personalized healthcare. Imagine every person is different, right? And we want to uh, be more accessible uh, and easier to get the uh, uh, predictions and know our what is our body doing, right? By having something like a watch or some other sensors that are mobile, that's portable, very small, and very accurate, right? can tailor for each each everyone's individual um, uh, body conditions, medical history. As personalized healthcare relevance, and also precision agriculture, when to water the uh, crop, and also uh, whether uh, are classifying different crops, right? So a lot of applications as well. And lots of scenarios are underdeveloped, right? So AI is quickly getting into every domain of our lives, but not not all the domains, right? Computer scientists are particularly in. Some, some domains like autonomous driving, but not everyone is uh, doing the uh, doing that for the whole society, right? So tiny ML is really a, a, a good tool to penetrate AI to everywhere 
um, each aspect of our lives, right? So hope that's enough motivation. So let's talk about um, the uh, difficulties, right? So cloud AI, mobile AI, we can easily get gigabytes of memory, right? Um, but for these microcontrollers, uh, the ASRAM and the flash is super limited, right? 320 kilobytes of memory for activation memory and about one megabyte for storage for those weights, right? So we'll talk in detail what's the difference between this uh, SRAM memory versus flash storage very shortly. But there are those three or two to four orders of magnitude of drastically uh, smaller uh, amount of memory resources, right? So there is no prior art about neural network design for any uh, scenarios, right? So we should rethink about the design space and the design methodology for such type of uh, So for these mobile phones, right? We are sometimes constrained by uh, latency and also energy, right? But now we have a new thing, which is the memory system. For a mobile phone, we can easily get uh, gigabytes of memory, okay? Although you wanna have a particular uh, allocated memory uh, space for different applications, but this is a lot of memory for you to use. Like here is only a couple of hundred kilobytes, right? So this memory can drink is a new challenge for tiny now. So we wanna understand the challenges deeper, right? Where exactly, what's the exact like, difference between uh, this SRAM versus this flash, the activation memory versus the weight memory. Okay. So let's re have a recap of uh, the CN architectures. Okay. So there are several convolution layers followed by a very few uh, or none uh, fully connected layers. Right. So after each convolution, uh, we have activation involved with the kernel. Then we have the output output activation. Right. So uh, for the kernel, the weights, okay, they are static, right? Uh, they are not, uh, they are the same across the life cycle of inference, right? So we can put them in this read-only memory, such as uh, flash, right? Um, this is permanent, this is storage, right? And for input activation and also output activation for different images, um, those activations are different, right? So we want to put them in the, both are readable and also writable memory, right? So we put them in the S rank. Okay. Um, so for these microcontrollers, as I do know, Arnold, it has 256 kilobytes of S rank, uh, one megabyte of flash. Okay. So give you an idea how small, what is the range of memory resource to store the activation and store the weights. Okay. Um, this is another popular. Um, that for IPM32 F746, which we widely use in our experiments. Okay? And also we will be using that for your lab four. Okay? We give you opportunity to play with one of such boards and to implement the neural nets so we can demonstrate to your mom at home. <laughs> so this board has 320 kilobytes of flash RAM and one megabyte of flash. And all our, our job is to be able to squeeze the neural nets so uh, small enough to fit uh, such tiny little devices. So uh, the flash storage, okay? So that's concerned about the weights, okay? the model size. Since the model weights are not changed, so they can be put in the uh, uh, static uh, uh, read-only memory. Okay? So we, be, we need to hold the weights unchanged across the entire life cycle for this LP. And the other side is the SRAM. Okay? SRAM is even smaller, a couple of hundred kilobytes. Okay? So we store this input and output activations okay, in the SRAM since we have to both read and write. And it's dynamic. Different inputs, different layers, the number is completely different. Okay? So we care about the peak SRAM during inference. Why peak SRAM? Since for inference, once we finish layer i and layer i plus one, we can throw away the activation of layer i since we're not doing any back propagation, right? Just be forward. So the peak memory 
determine is the real bottleneck. As long as the largest layer's activation is smaller than 256 kilobytes, then we are okay. But if all the layers are like 10 kilobytes, only one layer is 256, 257 kilobytes, then you still cannot meet, right? So we care about the peak as well. Uh, but here, weights are not counted since we can partially fetch the weight, right? For calculating layer one, we just need to fetch uh, the weight for layer one. So uh, for the approximation, the SRAM usually is just input activation plus output activation. But in the real scenario, we also have to consider these partial weights. Okay? And also for the flash storage, we also have to consider the code segment. If you have learned 6004, uh, you know that the code segment also take some of the flash, uh, some of the storage. Right? For microcontrollers, this is not negligible. So reducing the code segment by doing such compilation-based approach, uh, we have to very be very careful about also about the code size of your of your model. Okay. A question. Uh, so when you're running a neural network on a computer like that has the NVIDIA GPU, where are these uh, on the computer? Are they the RAM of the computer or are they something in the GPU? Oh, so this is just for microcontroller, right? For yeah. GPU, we have a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot more resources. For GPU and normal computer, we have the DRAM. Mm -hmm. Um, microcontroller, we don't have a DRAM, right? So between Flash and SRAM on GPU, we have a pretty large DRAM. Right? For example, the A6000 GPU that we have in our lab has 48 gigabytes of of of, uh, of uh, GDDR, uh, GPU GDDR. Um, so that's the difference. But on microcontroller, there's, there's no DRAM, there's no operating system, there's no paging. So everything you have to manage by yourself. It's called bare metal. In the SRAM, you have a cat on the chip itself, or what exactly? So why do we not have DRAM? Uh, so everything is just one single chip, right? Okay. DRAM is a separate chip. Okay. But the microcontroller contains only a single chip. And that's the whole computer. And the flash is also embedded. The, uh, the flash is also embedded on the in the chip. Okay. Embedded flash. Um, Could you not just buy a separate SRAM module and just address that yourself and just put on a PCB with the microcontroller? Oh, you mean DRAM? SRAM is on the chip. Oh, sorry. It's, it's yeah. DRAM. Yeah. So that's no longer uh, the something that's one to two dollars. Oh, fair enough. So you want to make it tiny, small, and low low power. All right, so uh, let's see what is the gap roughly like. So rather than 50, remember we talked about the real bottleneck is the peak as well, right? So the largest layer, right? So rather than 50, so um, this is the amount of uh, peak as well that is required. Actually from ResNet to moment and before, uh, the peak as well didn't get decreased by too much, right? Because conventional this kind of model design are for mobile devices, mobile, mobile net, right? On a mobile phone, we really don't care if it's like several in, in the order of many several kilobytes, since the mobile phone can easily have gigabytes of memory. But for tiny microcontroller, this is not the case. Uh, even if we quantize that to int eight, dividing this number by four, uh, this is still much larger than uh, the uh, resource constraints, the SRAM resource constraints of a microcontroller. So we want to bridge this gap. So let's see uh, what is achieved by prior work. For example, in 2016, Resnet was proposed. One year, mm -hmm. uh, two years later, Mobile 92 was proposed. At that time, people focusing on, are focusing on reducing the number of parameters. Right? So the number of parameters gets reduced by 4.6 times. That's actually pretty significant. And they are both having the same 70% like image net top five accuracy. Less than 18, where it's a small time tool, strengthened by 75%. Okay. However, what we care is also the uh, peak activation, like the largest layers activation. From ResNet to MobileNet, actually, that didn't decrease, but I even increased right, by 1.8 times. So, anyone have some idea why? What is the, since we talk about the architecture for both? 
uh, ResNet and also MobileNet P2, and everyone can um, think why, which layer is resulted in the larger peak activation size. The inverted bottleneck, what does it look like? How many layers? What is the architecture for, for three convolutions plus activation? Right? And we have a one by one convolution followed by three by three depth wise, right? But there is an expansion ratio that is either three or six. What does that mean? That increased the number of channels by six times by using the steps as a convolution, right? So the activation also grows a lot. Although that saves the number of weights because it's a depth wise convolution. The number of parameters is no longer at three by three by input channel by output channel, but three by three by output channel, right? But that saves the weights. But the six X expansion ratio greatly increased the activation size. So that's the limitation for uh, this mobile net with respect to the size of activation. Um, so we will discuss MCU net, but also reduce the uh, number of peak activation. So is everyone on the same page? Why mobile net V2 has, what is the suspension ratio? Why is six times larger? Yeah, I see some confusing faces, so let me repeat that. Um, so for uh, for mobile IV tool, right? Remember, we this, the structure is a uh, one by one convolution followed by a six uh, x expansion ratio for the channels, okay? followed by another um, uh, one by one layer, right? So this layer is a depth wise layer, okay? Depth wise three by three convolution. Um, the number of channels is six times larger than its input. So that's the reason this inverted bottleneck. So bottleneck is like this. So this is bottleneck. You have one by one here, three by three in the middle, and one by one in the end. This is bottleneck. The inverted bottleneck is like you have something much larger in the middle and smaller. On both ends. So this becomes the bottleneck, right? So bottleneck layer, the inverted bottleneck layer, this middle part is six times larger than uh, this previous and next layer. Everyone get the point? Okay, good. All right, so having talked about the challenges of tiny ML and the challenges of the peak memory, let's dive deep into how do we solve these challenges by tiny neural networks. Uh, so we'll just describe two pieces of work from our book. Uh, one is MCUNet published in uh, 2020, the other is MCUNet V2 in 2021. Both were highlighted by MIT News. So um, existing work. Okay, either focus on searching the neural network model, assuming we have a fixed library, right? So such as proxy NAS, MNAS NAS, which we covered in the NAS lecture before, right? Assuming that uh, it is the hardware fixed library, we wanna just tune the neural network architectures. Another uh, kind of work focusing on changing the library, right? making innovations by writing a more efficient library such as PDM to tune the kernel to the library. Right? So given such memory constraint, our microcontroller, we find it not enough to do either. But we should open the design space to design both the neural network architecture ourselves and also the inference engine, which is the inference library on the microcontroller on ourselves. Okay? So which opens up a larger design space uh, and allow us to do a better trade-off. So this tiny NAS stands for tiny neural architecture search, okay? provide efficient neural network architecture. And this tiny engine provides an efficient compiler and runtime. Okay? So they work coherently with each other. Uh, so first using tiny NAS, we design auto optimize this neural network structure, which is the focus on today's lecture. 
and for time ng, we will introduce that in lecture 17. Okay. Uh, both Tiny NAS and Tiny Engine are open source on GitHub, so you're very welcome to use them for your course lecture project, uh, course project as well as your, your research projects. Um, so we talk about this big picture of neural architecture search, right? So rather than using human expertise to manually design the neural network architecture, okay? so we want to use this computational resource to assist conventional human design. Right. We use a lot of feature resources uh, to do this automatic uh, architecture search. And we described that in order to do mass, we, we need to have the right search space rather than searching uh, across the entire forest. You want to narrow down the search space if you want to find your friend who gets lost. Right? So the quality of the search space actually determines the performance of the model, right? So the first thing, first step is to narrow down from this full network search space to some sub spaces. Okay, we wanna take a good search space to begin with. So there are several options. What determines um, to find a good design space, okay? Um, so uh, option one is to use, reuse a prior um, design space that are carefully designed by uh, other teams, right? For example, I am not space, we're going to be three space, one small space. However, um, those uh, search spaces are actually designed for mobile devices, like mobile phones, which has much larger computational capability than such a microcontroller. Right? So this option is not quite viable because even the smallest sub network the smallest sub network in this search space still cannot fit the hardware resource. Okay? For example, a microcontroller has 300 kilobytes versus a mobile phone has four gigabytes of memory. So it's hard to reuse at the mobile search space. Therefore, uh, we want to pick a uh, customized search space for this IoT device. And how do we do that? Um, so we can specific um, scale the uh, mobile network search space okay, by using different resolution and width modifier. So this resolution and width modifier determines a sub search space. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, the original search space for mobile phone, people widely use this resolution of 224. If you go to image that most of the resolution is 224. Um, and the width modifier is 1.0, okay? But this is not the case for uh, microcontrollers. Uh, for GPU, we can have a larger resolution, larger uh, width modifier, but what about for these microcontrollers? And also, they can have completely different memory resources from 256 kilobytes all the way to 512 kilobytes. So we wanna first design this design space and optimize the design space and then perform neural architecture search. And here are the design knobs that we want to kill, right? So the resolution and width modifier we mentioned that determines, defines a search space. And within the search space, we want to further search at the external size, okay? Maybe five, seven, okay? and expansion ratio and also the number of blocks, the depth per stage. So let's discuss how do we uh, design a good search space, okay? So um, we don't have to look at the figure yet, but the key principle here is that uh, computation is cheap. Memory is expensive, right? We wanna perform more computation given the same amount of memory footprint. So here the heuristic becomes uh, given um, the same memory to drink, right? Uh, a good design space is more likely to achieve higher blocks okay, under the same memory to drink. So here we've plotted several design spaces uh, with resolution, width ranges from 0.3 to 0.7. Resolution ranges from like 96 all the way to 160. So we plotted a lot of combinations of such 
uh, width, width and also the uh, resolution pairs. Okay. And then we just analyze what is the uh, number of blocks that can fit, right? So this doesn't require any training. We just calculate the blocks analytically. For this red event space, okay, which is with a beautiful fine resolution of 144, okay, we can see the, uh, pretty much all the models, okay, all the models are larger than uh, 41 million blocks in this design space, which is pretty, pretty good. However, a bad design space like this, all the models has only 28 million blocks okay, in this design space. And for the red design space, 20% of the models are larger than this 50.3 million blocks, which is larger than this black design space, where 20% of the models are larger than 32 million blocks. So by be able to fit more flops means that we can have more operations, more capacity in this model, right? It's more likely to achieve higher, higher accuracy, right? Um, so larger flops indicates larger model capacity, more likely to achieve a higher accuracy. Right? So the condition is that they are given the same memory constraint. So we should first should have to should fit this model, right? Of course, larger flops also means longer latency, right? But computation is cheaper compared with memory footprint. These two design spaces, uh, these two designs can have the same memory. all all falls under the same memory constraints, okay? All right, so um, using that heuristic, we um, try to find what happens when we have different size of the SRAM okay, versus different size of the flash. Okay. So on the, on the, on the top, uh, we plotted uh, the scenario for um, uh, between this flash and also the SRAM okay, uh, for the uh, width modifier. Okay, on the bottom, we call it that for the uh, resolution. Okay. Modify width modifier ranges from 0 0.3 all the way to 0 0.9. Okay. The resolution ranges from like, um, 80 by 80 all the way to like two, uh, 208 by 208. So as the flash increases, but given the same on of amount of SRAM, so we are increasing the flash from about 12 kilobytes all the way to four megabytes. So what happens to the model design? Let's brainstorm a little bit. What happens to the model design um, if we increase the number of flash? Uh, how should we change um, the width modifier and also the resolution? With modifier, uh, the green part is the resolution. <laughs> right, the width modifier is dependent on the flash, right? Since we have larger flash, means we can fit a larger model, right? Therefore, we want to have more channels, right? So we increase the channel with modifier from 0.4 to 0.8. Right. But increasing the number of channels also means uh, we, we, we will require larger amount of SRAM if other things stay the same. However, we have the same SRAM, therefore we can only decrease the resolution so that we can still fit within the same amount of SRAM. Right. Okay, so what about the other direction? We increase the SRAM and increase the SRAM, um, increase the SRAM. But we keep the same amount of flash. What happens for the width modifier and for the uh, resolution? The answer is there, but I'll give you some time to think about it. So we can see the SRAM didn't change much, right? 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. 
Because um, we have the same amount of, amount of flash, meaning that the, the weight is the same. So uh, we shouldn't change the uh, width modifier because the weight should stay the same. However, we have more SRAM. Therefore, we can hold a much larger resolution, right? So the resolution becomes bigger from 112 to 408, right? From 80 to 144. Okay. So this gives you a good exercise about seeing the trade off between how do we adjust the width modifier uh, on the top versus the resolution on the bottom, given different resource constraints on SRAM and also for the flash, right? This might also be helpful for those of you who want to play with new technologies, right? Some of the technology may have some uh, read-only, um, non-volatile versus volatile, right? So this gives you an idea when you're designing the um, neural network architectures to fit um, different memory constraints, okay? So here's the answer if you want to go back and really digest it, okay? Everyone on the same page? Yeah, Would the resolution right. be in the volatile memory, or is it? Oh, so the weight have to be in the non-volatile memory. You have to keep the weight across different inferences. Yeah. And for the resolution for the input image, the activation you can put it in the volatile, like high SRAM, since it's gone away uh, from layer I to layer I plus one. All right, so after designing the search space, then we can perform neural architecture search. So we can use the uh, once for all neural architecture search approach, right? So where we first train this neural net, each time we, run, uh, we sample different sub networks, either random sample or using this appropriate drinking method. And then we sample them, we join 25 few multiple sub networks, they share the weights, right? like different components. They share the weights with each other. Um, and those smaller child networks are actually nested in larger ones because they share the weight. So we just need to keep one largest copy. Then we can have multiple smaller copies to fit uh, different microcontro microcontrollers constraints. Okay, so um, the neural architecture search model, right hand side, compared with the uh, hand, hand design models. Uh, mobile 92 is on the left. Uh, we can find actually uh, this is plot of the uh, peak, uh, the peak memory for different stages. Right? Um, for manually design model, actually the largest model versus the average model that differs by 2.2x. So this is really a dominating uh, stage. But for tiny math, this number is only 1.6 times deeper, right? Meaning that the tiny math design model has a, a better utilization, right? A less aggressive dominating stage like the human design model, where this one is flatter. And then we'll talk about other techniques to even get rid of such dominating um, uh, activations. So here I'm gonna show some results. Okay, so I assume that uh, this is the latency and on the right hand side is the peak SRAM usage. So, Several baselines, more than any two from Google, but it is that which we described before. And this is our uh, prior result in 2019 in the low power provision challenge. Okay. So, by um, designing uh, this tiny, um, tiny NAS, uh, we found this visual wakeworth data set. We can achieve like 2.4 times faster model, okay, requiring uh, 3.7 smaller amount of SRAM while maintaining. The same accuracy. Okay, so uh, just now we uh, we briefly talk about this uh, memory bottleneck, right? So, um, for example, uh, this block have a huge amount of memory, okay, which dominated all the layers. Um, so, even if uh, these layers are all smaller than um, what we have as a memory budget. These layers are very, uh, are very bad. So these kind of stages cannot fit this 256 
kilobytes of memory chain three a microcontroller, right? Only these models can be, and they differ by as much as eight times. Okay, then how do we uh, find the ways to uh, conquer such problem for these dominating activations? Right. So, all right. So let's continue our discussion about how do we conquer such memory bottleneck for several dominating layers. Okay. Um, so conventionally, um, when we are doing inference, we do this layer by layer inference, right? So we do layer one, layer two, right? So when we are doing inference, we have to keep both the input activation and output activation in the memory when we are processing that layer, right? So the largest memory footprint is equal to the max of this sum versus this sum. Okay. Um, given the first couple of stages where we have this large resolution, such peak memory could be pretty large. Right? But for la later layers, as the re resolution gets pulled, uh, the uh, footprint will be smaller. That's why uh, those peak memory uh, happens in the first couple of stages. Right? Um, so we propose kind of a new, new idea with this patch-based inference. Rather than processing the entire uh, H, H by, uh, by W, we want to process maybe only a quarter of that. Right? Imagine you are eating a, a, a pizza. A pizza is too big, but you just want to have a quarter of the pizza at a time. So this is the peak memory power that is needed. And after computing that, we have this partial solution. Right? We only have this partial output. So we have to mechanize the whole memory to, to store these partial outputs. But luckily, after the pulling layer, uh, the memory footprints become much smaller. Therefore, we can have the opportunity to shrink the uh, peak memory. This is example of uh, dividing that by two, two by two chunks. Okay? We can also divide it by three by three patches. Right? In that case, the peak memory would be even smaller. Very simple, I think. <laughs> so the reason we can use this is thanks to um, the fact that we have these pooling layers, right? So at some point, we have to store the entire piece of the entire H and W. Uh, due to several stages of pooling, uh, that H and W becomes smaller. So this is before, and this is after this patch based inference, right? So this is before patch based inference, the peak memory could be as big as 100, uh, 100, uh, 1,400 kilobytes. Right? And after this patch based inference, it's something below uh, 280. Right? So we uh, successfully alleviated, uh, alleviated this peak memory issue. So evaluated how many different benchmarks right? over the new tool, redistributed from FD net uh, and CMAT. Uh, this, this is the peak memory for the national per layer based inference. Right? Um, this one is using a two by two patch, okay? and this is using this three by three patch. So theoretically, three by three patch saves you uh, nine times the memory, but due to you have to store the last layer, the actual save is smaller, which is from uh, four times to five uh, to four, five point nine times. Okay. Um, so is that the uh, uh, the whole solution? Actually, there is a an issue with this uh, patch based inference. So imagine we are doing this uh, threaded uh, convolution. So this convolution, you know, have this receptive field, right? So um, uh, after one layer, uh, this is the receptive field becomes amplified by two x since we have a thread of two. Uh, after another layer, uh, since we do a three by three convolution, each layer will expand uh, the, uh, the receptive field uh, by by two pixels, right? So we have this halo region, which is the overlap between uh, different uh, uh, pixels. Um, so running such patch based inference will lead to this overhead of computing this halo twice, right? Um, so this spatial overlapping gets larger as yeah, so the receptive field grows, leading to larger computation overhead. So how how much is the overhead? It can be as large as ten percent. So for more than me two, it increased. The median max from 300 to 330 uh, median max. Okay? So, using such patch based inference. So, all is due to um, the uh, much larger receptive field. 
So naturally, we can think about the technique to redistribute the receptive field, right? So here, uh, we um, move one of the layers from the first couple of stages to the later couple of stages, right? So the total receptive field, uh, the total receptive field keeps the same, right? But here we replace the two by three count with this one by one count, which doesn't expand uh, the receptive field. So by tuning this neural network model, okay, by changing the neural network model without changing the inference library, uh, we can reduce its overhead. So the final flops is is going back to three hundred and one daily max. So same performance on the classification of the detection with negligible overhead. Um, and finally, uh, we jointly optimize the neural network architecture and also the inference schedule. Okay? Number of layers, number of channels, the kernel size, as we did before in the uh, one small technique. And also here, we tune the inference scheduling, including the number of patches. Okay? Uh, how many layers can we use? Are we using the patch based inference versus per layer based inference? Mm -hmm. uh, other knobs are uh, the same from uh, tiny engine. Okay, so this is the result on um, the visual weight first data set. Visual weight first is basically we detect whether there's a person or there's no person in, in, the, in the room, okay? so that you can turn on the appliance or turn off the appliance or the lights or whatever you have, the AC, etc., by detecting whether there's a person or no person. One very widely used tiny ML application. You can use such data set in your final project, which can fit only 30 kilobytes of hash RAM. So you can have Arduino, it's very likely to fit such a um, tight memory constraint. Um, so uh, this is a mobile and tool plus Google's uh, TensorFlow Lite, okay? TensorFlow Lite Micro. Um, and this is our result in 2019, right? In 2019, we can achieve. Um, 256 kilobytes of SRAM with 88% top line accuracy, right? So 88% we are having the uh, correct prediction. Uh, this is our 2020 result, MCUNET. Okay, so MCUNET, uh, we reduce the memory from 256 mm -hmm. to 128 kilobytes, but with even higher accuracy, now we have 90% accuracy. Uh, so the second version of MCUNET V2 actually further pushed that by four times, okay? So still 90% accuracy, but require only 30 kilobytes of SRAM, okay? Um, and this is showing the uh, memory reduction from 20 to 30 kilobytes. And also this is showing um, this IPM32 as over 12 microcontroller okay, with uh, 236. Uh, kilobytes of SRAM, the accuracy improvement from OpenIV2, which uh, only 49% top line accuracy to about uh, 64 top line accuracy with MCN IV2. And this is another constraint, uh, slightly better um, uh, device. This is Cortex M4, this is Cortex M7 with slightly uh, larger memory. Okay. Um, and on the right, right hand side is showing the detection accuracy, right? The detection is a different path. We want to not only classify what it is, but also show the bounding box for each object, right? So here, uh, from moment I've pulled to MCN I've pulled, 16.9% improve of copper accuracy. So from classification to detection, we can find that by smarter model design, the improvement on detection is much higher, much larger than um, the classification, right? Because so I'm soon as it can uh, alleviate this large activation issue so that we can fit a larger resolution, right? And for detection paths, the resolution matters a lot. Otherwise, those small objects will be completely lost under uh, small resolution, right? That's why such detection paths we can feel we can have, we can have a much um, more significant accuracy improvement compared with classification. And also uh, detection is actually a very widely used 
application pipeline they use the same application. So I highly recommend to try that for your final product. Okay, so here we wanna do a deep dissection to understand why this p 2 v 2 architecture works quite well. So here is the architecture for m 2 v 2 um, You know, it has different colors. Okay, so um, for example, um, this dark red color indicates the kernel size is seven by seven, versus this one is five by five, orange, versus the, uh, the yellow one, it's smaller kernel, three by three kernel. Okay. Um, the legend um, is denoted by the um, expansion ratio, okay, indicating the number of channels. Expansion ratio four, 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 etc. And this is wider, right? The expansion ratio of six. And then followed by kernel size times kernel size, right? Seven by seven layer, three by three layer, etc. Uh, we can find that the uh, kernel size in those per patch base stage is very small due to um, we want to reduce the spatial overlap. Right? So this per patch based universe, we want to reduce uh, the, the receptive receptive fields overlapping in order to reduce the uh, unnecessary computation. So here they are using smaller kernels, even one by one kernel. Secondly, this expansion ratio in the middle stage is small to reduce the peak memory, right? So we can find the expansion ratio is only four in the first couple of stages, since here we still have pretty big resolution still over here. Right? So in order to reduce peak memory, they chose to have a pretty um, middle size, like only four for the expansion ratio. But in the later stage, they begin to use a uh, much larger expansion ratio since the resolution is already pretty small. So then it makes sense to have a larger expansion ratio in this inverted bottleneck layer, right? So here we can have a much larger expansion ratio without hurting the peak memory since the resolution is already really small in the later stage. Okay, and um, I'm assuming that V2 can hold a much larger resolution, 160 by 160, compared with um, uh, I'm assuming that the first version of I'm assuming that. That's why it performs quite good on those uh, resolution sensitive tasks, for example, detection tasks. Okay? So, all these rules, we never taught the neural net designer to, to do this, right? But by do, using this tiny NAS, tiny neural architecture search, the design model really makes sense if you want to dissect all the design uh, details very smart. <coughs> and we don't have to train, uh, train a designer to do that, but just push the button, let the GPU do the, do the search, and then finalize it can return as the model that fits such constraints. All right, so I'm going to introduce uh, more, some a couple of other works. Okay. Targeting this tiny ML and tiny model design. Okay. So far, we talked about using CNNs for these vision models, right? So, what about combining CNN with some RNs? Okay. So, this work is called RN pool, right? Focusing on reducing the uh, peak memory okay, for the first couple of stages where the resolution is large. Use this method, it can uh, aggressively pool the model by four times. By using this RNN layer, okay, uh, RNN has like time stamps of, of four stamps, uh, of, of four uh, time stamps. Okay, so passing through a recurrent neural network to get a final answer, similar to for other four rows, and then pass it through a, a second <laughs> recurrent neural net, pull in both directions to get um, uh, the final results. Okay, and then it does the same process in the other direction. In the vertical dimension has every four elements into a recurrent neural net and then has it in the result to a bidirectional neural net uh, in both directions. Okay. And they can the output of all the passes and become the final output. So this final output is really uh, due to the result of the 16 pixels. Okay. So it quickly pulls resolution from the original resolution to that divided by four, okay? So uh, it very quickly shrinks the resolution. 
So as a result, rather than having such a lot of large resolution activation bottlenecks, that gets replaced with this RN pool layer. Okay? So quickly reduce the resolution from 112 to 28, okay? four times smaller using this RN pool layer. So we no longer have uh, the memory bottleneck. So very interesting idea to replace a sequence of blocks here of convolution blocks with, with the recurrent units. Another work called Micronets. Okay? So um, the key idea here is how to estimate those hardware costs of the neural network, including the latency, the energy, right? So the peak memory is easy to uh, uh, analyze, right? You can uh, easily calculate them for a given model since that is static, it's not hardware dependent. And from this paper is finding that actually the latency Okay, as a matter of the operation clock, the median, um, median OPS, okay, is actually, um, um, the latency is actually linear to the number of computation blocks, okay, computation OPS, okay, assuming that um, we are sampling from the same supernet. Okay, so uh, they, they uh, learn both, uh, actually both the image backbone in blue and also this audio uh, backbone uh, in orange, okay? Um, and find that the M2 and the latency on the two microcontrollers are quite linear with, with respect to the uh, number of computation ops. So um, the subnets sampled from the same supernet we can actually assume this linear relationship between latency and flux. What about energy? People care about energy since we want to, most of these IoT devices are battery powered. Right? Um, so, given the same assumption where uh, the sample from the same super assumption, the actual energy consumption in this paper they find is also, also linear to the mean OS, okay? since they are from the same design space, both for the vision model and also for the audio model. So, this really gives the insight how do we estimate the latency. And estimate uh, even the energy uh, without physically testing. So the precondition is that they are sampled from the same design space, the same supernet. All right, so let's conclude the tiny neural network design part. Okay, so we've mostly described how to reduce the peak memory. Okay, now let's cover a few applications, including tiny vision, tiny audio, and also tiny time series mm -hmm. and anomaly detection. So let's start with uh, tiny image classification. Um, so with techniques like MCUNet, we can do not only such easy toy application like classifying apples, other uh, apples, oranges, and bananas, right? But we can actually do such real life applications on large scale data sets, even match the, the accuracy up to 70% okay, on ImageNet data set. So that really unlock a lot of cool applications. So this is the top point image accuracy we can achieve on many different microcontrollers. Okay. Um, so conventional idea of conventional approach for those mobile ID tools are on the same system and achieve only about 54% uh, top point accuracy image net, which is even below Alex net. Uh, but with MCU net, we can achieve more than 70% top point image net accuracy, almost to the level of less than 18 by mobile ID one. Right. So uh, this is a big breakthrough. Um, and also it can enable several applications like uh, visual wafers, detecting if there's no person is the appliance can be idle. Once uh, the camera detects a person, then we can uh, do something, right? And if there's no person, the appliance can continue to go idle. It's pretty much like the, the vision counterpart of this K-serial or okay, K-Google, cool, right? Rather than speech trigger, this is a uh, vision uh, trigger. And this is a demo that we have uh, in building 36. We have a microcontroller attached to the elevator. If it sees a person, it will turn red. Uh, if there is no person, let's work again. Person, there is red. No person of people work away, and it will be green, right? To detect whether there is person in the, in the room.
Um, so that is that is a basic like classification task. We we can also do object detection task, right? So object detection not only have to predict what it is, but also where it is. So it is very actually very sensitive to resolution. As we decrease the resolution, we can find the classification model in the class. The accuracy doesn't drop significantly. But for, for detection, the accuracy actually, actually drops very significantly as we reduce the resolution, right? Since in object detection, if you have a small object, if you if the resolution is too low, you cannot detect those small objects. So it's very crucial to have a large resolution. But it's not free lunch, right? Large resolution means you want to have a larger peak memory, right? Which is limited on microcontrollers. That's why we need techniques like the MCUNet to reduce the peak memory so that we can enable this detection to draw these bounding boxes um, um, uh, locally on these microcontrollers. Right? Uh, so here we are doing phase and mass detection by not only single person, but also multiple person, mass, no mass. Okay? Um, and on the right hand side is person detection, people walking by, people sitting there, and all be accurately detected. So this is really the benefit from such patch-based method allow a larger input resolution and saves the peak memory footprint. Uh, here are more examples comparing the RNN tool um, and also the MCUNAV tool. So the MCUNAV tool can hold a larger uh, resolution and then a lot less misprediction. Right? Is predicting the hand as a face right? versus um, from, um, having a while less prediction for the, for the side of the face, right? Versus here, missing the prediction versus the left prediction. So, large resolution matters. Um, we can even actually do on device training. For example, this is on the microcontroller. Um, we have two buttons, one button here and also a blue uh, and also a green button. Uh, we can push the button as the camera is facing to different objects. Okay. And push it but just a couple of times. And then I can learn the back propagation and learn the new objects. And then without any uh, pushing the button, you can turn red for the first class and turn green for the second class, second class automatically. Is that what tiny TL? Um, so not only tiny TL only proposed this bias only update. So this technique is our new publication, New Roots 22, uh, called on device cleaning under 256 kilobytes of memory, which introduced a new idea, uh, sparse layer, sparse tensor update. And also use 8 bit quantization to do quantize the training. So we will um, leave it in the future lecture. We will cover that in the on device training, on device learning uh, lecture. So far, we covered everything is about inference, right? So in the second half of this semester, we are also going to talk about training, both distributed training and also on device training from next week. All right. Then let's switch gear from uh, vision uh, to audio applications. So lots of speech recognition uh, applications, text to speech, machine translation, a lot of speech or natural language related applications. Um, so the basic idea, the basic flow of uh, processing the speech signal is actually uh, having, a, say the, the speech command is actually lasting a, a time t, a, a, the total length is L. But we chop it into several small windows of so small L okay, overlap by S. So all together we have uh, this number of frames. Uh, big L subtracted by the small L divided by S plus one. Okay, this amount of frames. And for each frame, uh, people usually convert that into the frequency domain. Okay, the strength of different frequencies at different time steps. And then um, the popular approach is to run neural net, treat this as an image, okay? and run uh, convolution on this uh, uh, frequency domain uh, representation. Okay? And finally, get the prediction 
speech uh, classification problem. And people have found that such to see in face method by treating the uh, treating the representation of the image and run convolution on that, they usually have a lower lower error rate compared with just running DNS without considering time information. So here we, we, we show that it's deployable, um, uh, it's doable uh, to use NCUNet for such uh, visual, uh, for such speech command recognition tasks. Okay, so this is Google speech command data set. Okay. Um, we can have like 2.8 times faster inference compared with using Movement MV tool. Okay, since you know, after such conversion, it is just treated as an image. So all the techniques that we talk about for convolution neural nets can be applied here to deal with the, the speech data. And on the right hand side, it's showing the uh, MV four times stronger compared with using the uh, Movement MV tool. By switching to MCUNet. And finally, we'll cover a popular time series and anomaly detection tasks that is quite widely used in smart factories. So there are many application domains like detect whether the wire uh, is abnormal, right? Detect whether a capsule uh, has some broken parts, right? For example, if you use manual uh, manual inspection, that's going to take a lot of efforts. And whether there's broken parts in the, in the nuts or in the bolts, and also detect whether uh, fuse, arson, accident, explosion, uh, robbery, etc. Right? And these are vision-based methods. There are also other methods that are based on time series, right? like temperature, <clears throat> like uh, accelerometer, etc. Uh, so the basic idea for anomaly detection is using this auto encoders, okay, which is a neural network that encodes the input into a hidden space, into a low dimensional um, code vector. Okay? And by you passing that through a couple of other FC layers, which is called a decoder, and we want to fully reconstruct the input and the output, okay? and try to match the input with the, the output. <coughs> Since for normal detection, we usually only have the normal data. We don't have the abnormal data. So this auto encoder is able to encode the distribution if it falls within the same distribution as the normal data. But if abnormal data comes, comes here, uh, this auto encoder cannot reconstruct that data. So if we calculate the difference between input and output, we can um, figure out whether this is normal data versus abnormal data, okay? So this is purely uh, unsupervised. We don't have label, we just have the um, normal data where we don't have the labeled abnormal data, okay? So here's an example of reconstructing uh, the inputs. Right? And by, by seeing the reconstruction error, uh, if it is too big, then we will predict this is not falling under the same distribution as normal data, then we classify that as abnormal data. And this uh, uh, autoencoder is actually lost, right? It cannot be exactly recomputed. So even for the, the normal input, we uh, should expect the all error not to be completely zero, but a smaller number, right? And here is a uh, demo for anomaly detection in the lab. So this is a fact. If you rotate it, if you hold that, uh, so it will be classified as uh, abnormal, right? 
So the, the resource constraint is now our core type and four microcontroller, right? Two fifty two by top hash one, one minor mm -hmm. minor branch. So there are several commonly used um, anomaly detection approaches, including K means, right? Auto encoders and also uh, Gaussian mixture models. So feel free to use uh, this board to do your final project, but we don't want to restrict the final project. Just give you some idea. All right. So in summary, we talk about this tiny at all, both the challenges, the solution, and also several <laughs> applications. Okay. So we will have this paper presentation in the next lecture. Okay. One of three students. And from the next week, we will switch gear from uh, inference to talk about training. Okay? And we'll introduce techniques to make training faster, both on the cloud and also on edge devices. So we are already in the uh, middle part of the semester. I okay? hope you are enjoying the class. Uh, we'll be taking um, the feedback if you want to send us an email. Okay? And so far, we talk about this training inference part. And then we're going to cover the training part consistent with all. And also these application specific optimizations, including some of the most top topics in the Thomas Brady, point cloud, video understanding, and GAN models, okay? and also transformers and natural language processing, followed by several lectures on efficient quantum machine learning and final project presentation. Okay. So hope you enjoy the lecture. We are happy to take feedbacks. And today we have actual office hours for you. Uh, to help you uh, guide you through lab two if you have any questions. Okay, okay, that's it for this today's lecture.